So welcome everybody. This is the seventh of the Fizana talks uh, that we started uh, in early July. And uh, I welcome uh, Mayor Bruzin and Virat on this talk. Uh, the interesting thing about this talk was that, uh, you know, I met Virat the first time when he came on the recent uh, Zoroastrian Return to Roots program in March. And, uh, you know, since then we obviously have kept in touch. And one day he had a very interesting uh, Instagram post which was basically showing a graph of uh, you know the population of Iran over the last four or five hundred years, and uh, you know somebody you know it, this was a very interesting uh, graph, and it, it there had to be a very long and a detailed story behind it. So I reached out to Virat and I said like you know, what's the genesis of? It? And so he told research that his dad Merbuzin and he were doing, and uh, I said you know what you need to share this with a larger group. And, and that's the basis of how this, uh, the idea for this talk came about. So with that, I would request uh, Tanya to introduce both our speakers for the day, and then uh, they can take it over from them. Great, thanks Arzan. So hi everyone, thank you so much for making time to attend today's Fazana talk session. My name is Tanya and I'm the Chief Social Media Officer for Fazana, which is the Federation of Zoroastrian Associations of North America. Uh, just to give you a reminder, Fazana represents 27 Zoroastrian associations across Canada and the United States, which is roughly 25,000 Zoroastrians in total. Fazana Talks is a new digital initiative we launched this year to engage the Zoroastrian community with our youth in particular, in order for us to discuss topics pertaining to our religion, our diverse culture, and our community. And if you want to stay up to date on future events, I just want to remind you that you can follow us on Instagram and Facebook at the Fazana. And these, are, these talks we facilitate our platform for people to simply share their thoughts, learn from each other, and also safe place just to have a dialogue. Today's session features Dr. Mayberzine Sarushian and Varaf Sarushian, who are going to be talking about Manekji Limji Hataria and how during his arrival in, India, in Iran from India, the Zoroastrian community there was on the brink of extinction. And today we'll go over what forms of persecution, discrimination, and extermination this once dominant community uh, went under that led up to this point. So with that, please, uh, I'd like to invite our presenters to speak. Thank you. Thanks, Tanya and Arzan for that, uh, for that warm introduction. Um, and thanks for the opportunity for us to present. Uh, we're covering about 1300 years of history. So uh, there's a lot to cover. And we, uh, we do apologize in advance for being verbose. But if anybody has any questions throughout the presentation, uh, we highly recommend that you use the chat function to ask them, and um, hopefully we can break, uh, break up the presentation by answering any of the questions that we were able to. Um, so a little bit about us. Um, uh, I'm Virav Sarushan, and this is my father, Mer Borzin. Um, and we're also being joined by my mother here today, Mer Banu uh, Zartushti, as well. Um, and this is a picture of my dad and I uh, during our first collaboration. We haven't really aged much since then, as you can tell. Um, and a little bit about me, uh, I, I have my background is in sociology and economics, um, and I have a master's in international economics, currently working in the management consulting field. Uh, my dad is retired now from a, a, a long career in physics and electrical engineering, but his, uh, his real passion has always been uh, the Zoroastrian community. Both of us are Zaratushtis. Um, and uh, his involvement has not just been on the community organizing side, but also on the scholarly pursuits. And uh, uh, w one of the things he did was he was a co-founder of the website Bohoman.org, which I believe was the first uh, website dedicated solely to uh, Zoroastrian scholarship. And I believe Jamshid Avarza is also on the call, who is also one of the co-founders. Um, thanks for joining us. Uh, he also is the editor of a book, The Fire Within, which is a collection of uh, essays on Zoroastrian culture, history, and theology by some of the biggest names within uh, the, the Zoroastrian studies field, uh, uh, including Richard Fry and Mary Boyce, all, all of which who he can consider personal friends of him. Um, and uh, there's a photo of the, the, uh, the book right there. For anybody who's interested, I highly recommend you get yourself a co copy of this. In fact, uh, when Harvard University had their Iranian studies program, it was one of their recommended readings. Um, so a little bit about the genesis of the talk. Arzan touched a little bit about this, but it, uh, 
The, the origination was uh, my father held a Zoom call a few months back, as many of us do during a global pandemic in order to keep in touch with one another. And the focus of this was on the history of our family. And he spent a good deal of time speaking about uh, uh, Shariar Surushan, who is uh, my great-great-grandfather, um, and essentially the patriarch of the family. A tremendous rags to riches story, um, which we won't go, we, we don't have time to go into the details of. Uh, but two things that were very striking, and especially in this time when there's a lot of, uh, uh, in the time of racial injustice and discrimination that's happening in America, uh, that really stood out to me. And they, they came in the form of these uh, two land deeds uh, that you see on the right-hand side of the page. And uh, maybe you can spend a little bit of time talking about what's so uh, significant about these two land deeds. Yeah, the first one uh, that is dated 1868 was a property that my, uh, you know, Azira said, great, great father bought. And uh, those days when you wanted to get a land deed, there was no registrar office that you would go and uh, get it. Uh, the only way was to get it from a local Ayatollah who was well known in the city. And uh, he would issue you. However, if you were not a Muslim, the chances that he would issue was very slim unless you could really bribe them. So in this deed, uh, you know, obviously it's cursive in Farsi, but the thing that I've noted here is on the third line, he refers to the buyer who is, uh, you know, our, our great, great grandfather. And uh, the way he refers to him is that obedient to Islam, Shar Yare Gab. Gab is a derogatory term used to refer to Zoroastria. It's like calling an uh, Afro-American with the N-word. So, and then he says he's the son of another obedient to Islam, Khudabash uh, Gab, another one. So that's really the word, the reference. Uh, last names were not in use until the time of Reza Shopalavi, and uh, so uh, you usually had to be referred to by your father. The other deed of property that Virov took an interest in was uh, another purchase that uh, he made years later. This is after, you know, monarchy had arrived and had been, you know, uh, operating in Iran. In this deed, the Ayatollah does not use the same terms. He still refers to, uh, he now refers to him very cordial term as the buyer. So that was something that perked Virov's interest. And uh, this was an example of how discrimination worked in those days. So. Yeah, so thanks, thanks for that. So just putting this in historical context, 1868, that was about 20 years uh, after uh, Manichi's first, uh, first trip to Iran. In 1890 is the year that Manichi uh, passes away. Um, so what, what I see these two deeds being is a, a very clear allegory for how combating racism and discrimination can, can change the fate of a person and a community. Now, not to diminish any of the grit and hard work that my great-great-grandfather had towards building his business, um, uh, towards building his business, uh, but there was a level of something else that was going on here. And a lot of that could be attributed to what Manichi did and the, the amelioration society did. So in summary, when the system is up against the community, it will oppress them and drive them to the ground. Examples of this can be seen in the land deed from 1868. But when a community is given reprieve and properly supported, it can prosper and grow. Um, and it's not hyperbole to say that there was an extensive amount of persecution and discrimination that Zoroastrians. It's not just reading into two simple landscapes, but what they underwent occurred over a, a series of tw uh, 12 centuries uh, uh, leading up to the arrival of Manichi. And when Manichi arrived in Iran, our community in Iran was in shambles. And I think that the French ambassador at the time said it best. Uh, only a miracle may save them from extinction. Um, so, uh, what, so what exactly happened that Zoroastrians went from being the majority religion of Iran at the end of the Sasanian Empire to being on the verge of extinction? And this is what you'll see through this presentation is systematic oppression, persecution, and extermination. Um, Many of us heard stories about this growing up. 
especially uh, us Iranians, Zaratushtis. But this is an opportunity for us to actually lay out a lot of the facts uh, and a lot of the proof of what has happened over this. Um, this is not meant to disparage any community or group for actions of the past, but rather to make uh, the Zoroastrian community in the world aware of uh, the, the, the suffering and injustices our community um, have undergone. So we're gonna, we're gonna talk about four, we're gonna break this up into four key areas. Um, the first is starts in 630 uh, with the Arab conquest of Persia, the arrival of Islam to the lands and the general persecution of all Iranians. Then we're gonna move on to the rule of the Safavids, uh, where discrimination against Zoroastrians became more systematic and targeted. Uh, and then we'll move on to 1789, which is the start of the Hajar dynasty. And for about half of their rule, uh, the Zoroastrians were essentially delivered their final blow that pushed their community into true despair. And then we'll enter into the phase when Manakshi enters, uh, arrives in Iran and starts to do his phil philanthropic work at the benefit of uh, at the benefit of the community. So in 630 AD, the Sasanians fell to the Arab invaders. Uh, this is noted as the last Persian, the last Zoroastrian Empire to rule all of Iran. Um, at the time, Zaratushtis were the dominant religion of the land. Uh, we don't have exact numbers, but we can probably estimate it at being around 60% of the total population or perhaps more. Um, and the priorities for, uh, and what, what we know is 20% were Jewish. So there was a level of uh, uh, religious diversity in the Persian empire at the time. Um, the priorities for the Arab invaders was to conquer as much of the Persian territory as possible. Um, uh, which was still putting up a stiff resistance uh, to, the, uh, to the outside forces uh, and to spread the uh, religion of Islam. Um, and so the suffering and persecution wasn't exclusive to Zoroastrians. There were also Christians and Jews, as we mentioned, and other religions in, um, in Iran that also suffered a lot of the atrocities and war crimes of the conquering forces. Um, so what were these things? So number one, there was mass enslavement. Uh, hundreds of thousands of Iranian women, children, and men were enslaved and taken to the Arabian Peninsula and sold at the slave markets there. Um, even those who did end up converting did not uh, achieve any re reprieve from, um, from persecution. Uh, Persian com uh, converts were considered second-class citizens. There was a specific term for them, mavalis or liberated slaves. And they were ba uh, denied basic rights, things like they weren't allowed to ride horses and uh, did not receive wages or um, spoils from the war. Um, this is also when we see the introduction of the Jezie, which is a religious tax that's imposed upon non-Muslims and something that's going to persist throughout until the time of Manichi. Um, even those who did end up paying the religious tax, they were subject to humiliation and discrimination by, by tax collectors. Um, a major blow to the religion uh, in general and our understanding of what, uh, what our forefathers uh, uh, had written was the systematic destruction of knowledge. Um, for example, when the Sasanian capital of Stesiphon uh, fell to the Arab invaders, uh, the commander wrote to uh, Caliph Omar on what to do with the book's massive library. Uh, and Omar wrote back, very similar to a letter that he had written on the fate of the Alexandria Library, which is a quote on the right-hand side that says, if the books contradict the Quran, they're blasphemous. And on the other hand, if they are in agreement, which with the text of the Quran, they're no longer, they're not needed because uh, the Quran is sufficient. So as a result, the huge library was destroyed uh, and the books which were products of generations of Persian scientists and scholars uh, were either thrown into, into fires or tossed into the Euphrates River. Um, on an individual level, uh, people were forced to burn their, uh, their religious books, uh, religious leaders were slain, and fire temples were either destroyed or converted into mosques. Um, there was also a concerted effort to wipe out the Persian language. The Arab, uh, Arabic was made the official language of Persia at the time. 
and there are examples of harsh, uh, harsh measures that were taken to enforce this. For example, the governor of Khorasan uh, would not acknowledge any other language except for Arabic. He banned all publication in Persian and forced uh, Zoroastrians to throw their religious books into fires. Um, the only reason the Persian language did survive was partially due to uh, some Persian scholars translating their works into Arabic and then later on retranslating them back into Persian. Um, what probably one of the biggest blows though that was uh, given to the Zoroastrians was the, the status that they were given as kafirs. So there are two statuses that could be given to non-Muslims at the time from my understanding. One is dhimmi, which is the people of the book. And the dhimmis are given some protections uh, under Islam. Um, for example, Christians and Jews are considered people of the book. And this is a big reason why there was a, a bit of a difference between the type of uh, persecution that Zoroastrians experienced versus what they did. Um, not to say that they didn't undergo a lot of, uh, a lot of persecution on their own. Um, kafirs are considered non-believers or heretics. Uh, and during the Abbasid rule, which was about 100 years after the fall of the Sasanians, Zoroastrians were deemed kafirs. Uh, they, were they were considered impure, barred from entering the royal court, uh, and some public places like the bathhouses and bazaars. Uh, and in, in my view, this degraded status opened the floodgates for ongoing persecution in later periods. Um, then there were also cases of mass slaughters of the non-Muslims. Um, again, much of this can be attributed more towards general war crimes than religious persecution, but because Zoroastrians were the majority of the population at the time, uh, they, uh, they got the worst of it. So for example, at Estakh, which was a Zoroastrian religious center, uh, when they put up a, a stiff resistance against the Arab invaders, tens of thousands of residents were slaughtered or hanged. Um, when the, uh, the Arab or the Umayyad marched on Mazandaran in the north, uh, the general ordered captives to be hanged at the two sides of the roads as some form of victorious parade for his army to pass through. And it's believed that again, tens of thousands were murdered in order to achieve the, uh, um, uh, the, the results of this parade. And yeah, so a good point is that uh, when they attacked Mazandran, they, they, they didn't end up conquering this, uh, conquering them. And this was actually an air, uh, this was actually continued to be a center for Zoroastrianism um, well after the rest of the, co the country had been conquered by, um, uh, by, by other forces. Uh, but when they did fail uh, to, to conquer Mazandran, the, the army turned their aggression to the city of Gorgan, which is to the east of Mazandran. Uh, and the general ordered the slaughter of enough Persians so that the water mills would run on blood. Uh, this is called the Blood Mills of Gorgon, and it was enough to feed his army for three days. Um, there were, of course, instances of targeted killings towards Zoroastrian during this period, uh, uh, one of which occurred around 1100 AD, uh, when a group of fanatic Muslims in, in Herat, uh, uh, now in uh, uh, present-day Afghanistan, uh, destroyed a wall of a mosque and blamed the actions on Zoroastrians. Um, and by the order of the Sultan, the governor of the, the province, many Zoroastrians of Greater Khorasan were murder, murdered and massacred as a, um, as a result. So during the nine centuries after the fall of the Sasanians, the population declined uh, due to coercion, forced conversions, and slaughters. But there was still a sizable population, um, which is estimated to be around three to five million. Um, roughly around 40% of the Persian Empire. Um, to give you a sense of that, that's around the population of Los Angeles today. Uh, so now we turn our attention to what happened uh, under the Safavids. Uh, a lot of the persecution was not unique uh, here, but it was far more systematic. Um, uh, This, uh, this had a lot to do with the fact that the, the Safavids uh, 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 this made uh, Shia Islam uh, the state religion in order to consolidate power against the outside forces. And so 
they turned their attention to coercing Zoroastrians and Sunnis to, uh, to convert their religion. Uh, Jews and Christians who continue to be considered dhimmi uh, to a certain degree were given reprieve. Um, for Zoroastrians, this meant restrictions on the type of work they could do. Uh, they were relegated to mainly manual labor. Merchants were not allowed in bazaars uh, and for a while were not allowed in caravanaries. Um, goods from Zoroastrian merchants were also considered to be impure and the merchants had to have faced a lot of difficulties in trying to sell them. Um, inheritance laws also became uh, an issue here. So uh, when somebody in your family converted to Islam, uh, they were entitled to all of the inheritance of the family. And this was either if uh, the conversion was by will or by force. So many Zoroastrian girls uh, at the time who were converted were, uh, were, 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 were being kidnapped and were being forced to convert to Muslims. And as a result, the, the, their, uh, they were uh, afforded the shares of the inheritance. Um, and then there was uh, Zoroastrians were forced out of urban centers and made to live in religious uh, ghettos. Uh, one example of this was in Kerman, um, which I think uh, my dad would probably be, be better suited to, uh, to tell the story about Ganj Ali Khan. Yeah, so Ganj Ali Khan was a Kurdish man. He was appointed by Shah Abbas as the governor of Kerman around 1600. And there was an event that happened that uh, the Zoroastrians of Kerman still observe to this day. And basically what happened, there were two young Zartushti men who were laborer. They, they got into a fight with their foreman who was a Muslim and they started, you know, alteration and uh, the Muslim guy got killed. So once this was uncovered, uh, it was taken to, the news was taken to Ganj Ali Khan that these two Zartushti men have killed the Muslim. What shall we do? And Ganj Ali Khan uh, asked the high mullah, the Ayatollah of Kerman to come and rule. And basically once he came, he said, yeah, I'm, I'm ready to give my verdict. And to give his verdict, he asked for them to bring a big container full of honey, honey, and then another container full of millet that Virov has. Then he rolled up his sleeve uh, put his hand all the way to his arm to, in the honey and stuck it in the container of millet and took it out and said, count how many millets are here, millet heads. That's how many Zartushtis we have to massacre to avenge the death of the Muslim. So once the official counted, they said, well, there are not so many Zartushtis in the city of Kerman, what shall we do? The governor said, well, go and round them up from around the province. Uh, they told him, well, it's going to take a couple of weeks to do that. He said, fine, we'll defer it until you get all the people. Uh, in the meantime, this was happening during the reign of Shah Abbas, who was ruling from uh, Isfahan. Uh, Shah Abbas, like Darius the Great, had, this, uh, uh, had put this system in place where he had spies going all around the country, uh, you know, disguised, obviously, and they were, they were trying to see what is going on in the provinces or what the governors are up to. And if something unusual happened, they were supposed to go back to Isfahan and report to him. So uh, the Shah Abbas' spy got wind of this because it was broadcasted all over. So he immediately galloped to Isfahan and within two days he was there and uh, every few days, Shah Abbas would slip out of his palace at midnight and go to the bazaar where he would meet this, uh, uh, this, uh, this spies who were coming back. So once he heard this is happening in Kerman, uh, the next morning, he, you know, he pretended he had, had a dream and he told everybody, we have to go to Kerman to see what is going on. Of course, uh, when he moved, all the mullahs and ayatollahs who were accompanying him would go with him. So within record time, they reached the suburbs of Kerman and they asked uh, one passerby, what is going on in the city? And uh, that guy said, yes, uh, Ganj Ali Khan has issued this order that all the Zoroastrians have to, uh, to, to gather in the city by such a date. He said, that's all. And then he said, well, if that, that's the case, then we won't need to do anything. 
because obviously he didn't want to appear to be showing any mercy towards the minorities. I mean, with all the courtiers around him. So he told him, well, let's relax and then we'll go back. But uh, he pulled one of his uh, officials aside and gave him his ring off uh, the, that the king was wearing, told him, march to the city, got up to the city and give it to Ganjari Khan and tell him that the guy who is wearing this is passing by. So as uh, the royal entourage was getting ready to return, Ganjari Khan, uh, you know, uh, arrived and uh, told the Shah, well, why don't you come to the city? He said, no, uh, I don't need to do that, but let's go for a quick walk. And uh, so away from everybody else, he told him, no, no, you have to stop this. You cannot do that. Uh, you can just go and hang those two young men, but then the rest of the population have to be spared. And then he told him, in, instead of hosting me, you can build the Karaman Sarah here. And then he left. And uh, so by, uh, by, by chance, the Zoroastrians were spared. <clears throat> However, Gandhi Ali Khan used this as an opportunity to expel them from the city. So he told them, you can no longer live within the confines of this fortified city. And uh, he took all the properties, including a couple of a fire temple that was in the middle of the city, which he, uh, you know, he, he became part of his complex and turned into a, a public bath. Uh, so they lost all their properties, but at least they didn't uh, lose their life. This is the history of Ganjali Khan. The real effect of this is in addition to being um, the economic and social implications of being uh, kicked out of the, the major city uh, uh, of your region, uh, there was also the physical risk that uh, Zoroastrians faced uh, as a result of no longer living within the, the walls of the city. And um, probably this ended up being quite disastrous. Um, I believe uh, when the, the Afghans, uh, do you want to talk about what happened in Gavoshu? Yeah, Afghans uh, were Sunnis. They, um, towards the end of the Safavid dynasty, they marched on, East. they wanted to march on Isfahan, and of course they had to pass through Kerman. Uh, the governor of Kerman uh, closed all the gates of the fortress city. So uh, they invaded all the villages around and the villages were mostly Zoroastrians. And uh, basically they killed anybody they could and took their properties or their you know, food, whatever. That's the massacre of the Washir that happened as a result. So once again, the Zoroastrians of Kerman suffered yeah. as a result. And there was another major incident that happened uh, at the end of the 17th century, when the uh, a, a future Safavid king, Shah Sultan Hussein, made a decree mandating all Zoroastrians convert to Islam. And so Zartushtis uh, had two choices to convert or risk their lives. Uh, those that chose, uh, some of them converted, uh, but continued to practice their, uh, uh, practice the, the traditions and uh, the, the way of life of Zoroastrian. And we have examples of this, where there are some villages that continue to uh, continue to speak uh, the Zoroastrian dialect of Dari uh, and also have some traditions. Um, then there is, uh, 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 but then there were other places that did not convert and uh, they were slaughtered. One of these was Gabrabad. So the backstory of Gabrabad is that earlier that century, many Zaratushtis were deported from Mazandaran, if you remember, that's where the Zoroastrian stronghold was, uh, to a ghetto uh, town near Isfahan. And they called it Gabrabad again. Gabrabad again, you see the word Gabr coming here and being invoked in the actual name of the, the city, that the, the village that they were living in. Uh, so these people were forcibly detached from their lands um, and their businesses and no jobs were given. They were basically moved there to do menial jobs to support the new capital of Persia in Isfahan. And uh, because they didn't convert, a bloodbath ensued and the entire population of Gabrabad was wiped out. Other nearby uh, areas were also hit. Uh, a French missionary is reported to have, uh, uh, to have lost their lives, uh, uh, that many Zoroastrians lost their lives and he saw many of their bodies uh, floating in the Zion, the Rude River. Um, the estimates of how many people lost their lives in, in, after this decree was ordered is, is not clear. French sources say tens of thousands, 
Zoroastrian sources say hundreds of thousands. Um, some did escape and those uh, relocated to Sharifabad and Yazd for the most part. Um, after the Safavid, uh, uh, the rule, uh, the population of Zoroastrians dramatically declined. So to give you a sense, uh, so it went from around 4 million to 50,000. And to give you a sense of what this is like, around the same time in, in, uh, in, in the, the Parsi community in South Asia was, uh, uh, was growing. Uh, the population of Parsis just within Bombay, the city of Bombay, was roughly around, I think, around the same of the population of Zoroastrians in the Persian Empire. So the entire population of uh, where the or religion originates from was around the same as just one city of Parsis in, in British India. Um, so this was a dramatic drop. Uh, at this point, most of the population was living in two areas, Yazd and Karaman. Um, so when the Khajars came around, uh, they started to tighten up persecution. Uh, there was a short reprieve under, uh, under a brief Afghan rule and under the rule of the Zens. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but they, the Khajars came and they tightened up persecution again. So financial discrimination was a major way. And the inheritance rules that we discussed before were still in place. Uh, the religious taxes, the jezie that we talked about, were also still in place. And in fact, they were even more brutal than they were before. Um, already a large portion of the population couldn't pay it. Sometimes corrupt tax officials collected two to three times the actual amounts to make sure everybody along the, the collection chain received their cut. Um, if a family couldn't afford to pay it, uh, they would be beaten, their children would be beaten, their religious books would be uh, thrown into the fire. Um, they, uh, and they were subject to public humiliation. Um, officials could also demand the jezie on site. And if the, uh, the person wasn't able to pay it, uh, they were beaten. Uh, rapes, forced marriages, murders, and kidnappings were still happening, uh, and they went unpunished. Um, Zoroastrians uh, were also not allowed to receive formal education, which left much of the population illiterate. Uh, they were restricted uh, in terms of what they could wear, how they could live, and where they could go. Uh, in terms of what they can wear, uh, Zoroastrians were required to wear sort of like a yellow patch or garb uh, that would basically signify their religion. Uh, this is kind of similar to what happened to the Jews uh, during the Holocaust in Nazi Germany. Uh, where they were uh, before the Holocaust, where they were required to wear a Star of David patch uh, in order to dis, uh, distinguish themselves from the rest of the population. Uh, they were prohibited to wear shoes, uh, only uh, slippers that had the fronts curved upwards. Uh, they couldn't wear new clothes. Um, they had to wear uh, dirty and torn caps. Um, and uh, there are cases where when people didn't comply with this, they were beaten and humiliated. In terms of where they lived, um, uh, in terms of where they lived, even restrictions were placed on their quarters. So their houses couldn't be taller than that of a Muslim. Uh, there were restrictions on how many windows they could have, how, how many doors they could have, and they weren't allowed to have bod gears or the old uh, uh, air conditioners in their house, which is extremely cruel considering how hot it got in Yazd and Kerman in the summer times. Uh, their freedom of movement was... Uh, was also restricted. They weren't allowed to ride horses. Uh, and even if they rode a donkey, they'd have to dismount uh, when a Muslim would pass. Um, and since they were considered filthy and unclean people, uh, they weren't allowed to go outdoors when it rained out of fear that they would pollute the waters. Uh, they had to carry around a shawl with them at all times, which they would need to sit on if they ever entered a Muslim's house. And many public places didn't serve them food. Forced conversions still also happened. One example that uh, Mary Boyce, uh, one of the uh, preeminent scholars uh, of Zoroastrian uh, culture and history and theology uh, pointed out was in Turkabad where on one autumn day, uh, while the men were hot harvesting the local crops, uh, a body of Muslims swooped in and took uh, control of the village of Turkabad. Uh, the men were threatened uh, and not only, not only with death for themselves, but horrors 
that would befall their women and children who at the same time were being terrorized at their homes. And by the end of the day, most of the village had accepted Islam and the fire temple was destroyed. So by the time the Manikshi entered the picture, the community was in shambles. And just to kind of make this a little bit interactive, uh, I'd love if people just took a moment to tell me, from the time of the Safavid rule until the arrival of uh, Manikji in 1854, what do you think the decline in the Zoroastrian population was? If you guys want to put it in the comments, uh, chat comments and tell us what you think. 90. Yeah, we're seeing a mix of answers. Great, so the actual answer is 98%. So by the time Manikji enters the picture, the community was in shambles. It's people poor, uneducated, and alienated. By then, only 7,000 followers could be found. So think about that. In 250 years, that's about how old America is. The population went from 4 million to 7,000. That's about the size of a, like a medium sized town. That's uh, uh, very small. And hence why we see the French ambassador uh, to, uh, to, to Persia saying that only a miracle can save them from extinction. So that's a very grim picture, and uh, and I do apologize for ruining anybody's Sunday by uh, with all the all the negativity. But this is the reality of what happened. So now we talk a little bit about what uh, about the 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 arrival of Manikchi. But before we actually get to Manikchi, we need to talk about two people who were very instrumental in uh, in him coming around. Uh, and the first one is uh, is on the left hand side, Golistan uh, Banu. Unfortunately, no picture of her exists. This is, uh, this is actually a picture of my mother wearing traditional Zoroastrian garbs, probably around the same age as when she uh, fled from Iran. Uh, so Gulistan was uh, living in Kerman and uh, she was part of one of, the, one of the few wealthy remaining families, Zartwishti families in Kerman. Uh, but she, she was very beautiful and she caught the eye of a wealthy Muslim from, who had traveled there from Yaz. Uh, Golistan was not interested and neither was her father uh, to the point where to avoid being kidnapped and forced to marry this guy, they fled to India. Uh, now at the time, the travel, the, the, uh, the travel of Zartushtis from Iran to India had almost stopped completely. And uh, is, uh, and uh, and basically the reason is because there was no travel by boats uh, and there was, uh, and the road to uh, the actual land route from Kerman to, or from Iran to Bombay was extremely perilous, especially for a woman and especially for a Zart. But they did it anyways, and they were successful. Uh, so successful that her father actually returned back a couple of times and brought the entire family as well as other members of the community along. Uh, and the remarkable thing is that the Parsi community in, in, in Bombay accepted them with open arms. Bolistan married a wealthy Parsi by the name of Pramji Pandey, uh, and they went on to have a very productive uh, family life. Uh, she bore nine children that we know of, and uh, within them, most importantly, she instilled in them uh, the importance of their background, their heritage, and the importance of service. Uh, she could never forget where she came from or the troubles that uh, her brethren in Iran was suffering from. Um, her eldest son, it's, and, and the, the, the philanthropy started with her eldest son, uh, who started a fund to help Zoroastrian refugees in Iran, um, who, had, who were starting to increase in number. The numbers that were coming over were increasing, thanks partially to Golistan's harrowing journey uh, and her setting, uh, her basically uh, creating the path for that. Uh, so her eldest son was taking care of uh, Zoroastrians that were arriving in India. And then her third son started the Amelioration Society, which bankrolled Manichi's first trip to Iran. So that's Golistan. 
And then on the right hand side, you see uh, Din Shah Manakshi Patil. He was the, many of you may know him, especially in the Parsi community. He's the second Indian to be made a baroness. And he was a very wealthy businessman who made his fortune in, uh, in trade to Europe, uh, most notably exporting cotton uh, while the US was, uh, was bogged down in its civil war. Um, but more important to our story, he married one of Golestan's daughters. And they ended up starting the second amelioration society, which bankrolled all of Manakji's philanthropy in Persia. So now we finally get to the, uh, to the man at the center of the story. Um, Manakji Limji Hataria. And he was basically made for this job in all senses. So physically, one description I've read of him is that his compact and sturdy physical stature meant he was built to endure the prevalent rigors for travel and his missions. Professionally, he began his career in government service and later as a merchant. So he was experienced, well-traveled, and skilled in the art of diplomacy. Um, Ambitiously, he had a strong passion for Iran. So he had started learning the Persian language and he always had a great interest in traveling to the land. Um, he, was, uh, he, was born in, he was originally born in Surat. Uh, his family migrated from Iran uh, uh, during the Safavid era. So he had been in uh, India for quite some time. And when he was five years old, his family moved, uh, they moved to Bombay. Uh, he was married originally to a Parsi woman uh, with whom he sired uh, uh, a daughter and a son. His son would join him in Iran and continue his, uh, his, uh, his work after uh, Manakshi passed away. Uh, after his uh, first wife passed away, uh, he ended up marrying, remarrying uh, Karamani Zarathushti. Um, so the interesting thing is by the time Manakshi actually traveled to Iran for the first time, he wasn't a young guy at this point. He was 41 years old, which today is still considered relatively young, but back then that was, that was pretty old. Uh, but he still made the journey nonetheless. Um, and on this mission, he did two things. He studied the general conditions of Zoroastrians, uh, and he also traveled all across uh, Persia to take an official census of the number. Um, and in terms of his report, this quote right here is a, a direct extraction from that report that he provided to the Amelioration Society upon his return. And the, 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 the truth rings out in terms of finding the community exhausted and trampled and that thinking that nobody in the world could be as miserable as, as them. In terms of the census, I'll let my dad talk a little bit about the data because it's actually, he was quite thorough in the work that he did. And uh, dad, maybe you can tell us what is so striking about this. Well, I mean, as you can see, he went from locality to locality and uh, uh, counted how many boys, girls, men, women were there. I mean, some of us of the Iranian Zartushtis who are in this call probably can unmask some of this, uh, you know, numbers here that are shown here. For example, I think Alaya Davistani can probably, uh, you know, name his great, great four generation ago from Sharifabad. I can do the same from Yaz, from Kerman and Yaz and Jamshid Varzo is on this call, probably can do the same thing from Yaz. He can name his, uh, because there is a name associated with each one of these uh, numbers here. So that's it, that's what it was. And as you can see, they were all very much related. When you have 7,000 people, and uh, they are basically a, a small group. They keep uh, remarrying. So that's, that's the state of affair when it was. And uh, one other thing I just wanted to note, the third line, there is a Ker Kermanshah. Kermanshah is actually a province on the Western side of Iran. I mean, all of these are Tushtis that we know of Yazdan Kerman on the Eastern part. Uh, Kermanshah was actually a province that's Shapur II, the emperor of uh, Sasanian. He moved some Zartushtis from Kerman to the west side of the country, which was you know, concentration of uh, um, Christians. And it's the time that the Sasanians and the Romans were fighting. And he wanted to make sure they had a counterbalance to the Christians. So he moved these Kermanis and the province of Kermanshah was uh, uh, was created. So there were still some Zartushtis there. In fact, when Monarchy on his first trip 
after he counted the numbers in Kerman and Yazd, he traveled to Tehran, then he traveled to uh, uh, Tabriz in Azerbaijan to meet the crown prince at the time. And then he moved down the western part of Iran and passed through Kerman Shah. So apparently he counted how many Zartushtis were around. But since then, that time, all of those relocated to Yazd. And uh, there are no more Zartushtis in Kerman Shah as of uh, later dates. The Manichu was actually very well traveled and it didn't just exist the, the, during this period. It also happened in his next uh, trip. He was actually given the nickname of Darvish Fani, which is the transitory Darvish, which partially has to do with all of the travels that he did throughout, uh, throughout uh, the Persian Empire, as well as all of the social circles that he was able to penetrate, whether it be the Zoroastrians and Kerman and Yaz, the diplomatic circles or the royal courts. So, so Manichu gives his, his reports um, and it basically creates a lot of buzz within the, uh, within the Parsi community back in Bombay. Um, uh, and, uh, and they sprung into action. So under Dean Shah Petit's leadership, uh, the Second Amelioration Society was formed and Manichu started preparing for his next trip to Iran. He, was, he had two objectives at this point. One was to get rid of the Jezie, the religious tax, and two was to remove all discrimination against Zoroastrians in Iran. So three years after his first trip in, in 1850, uh, he was back in Iran in 1857. And knowing that the only way that he could affect change was to convince the highest levels of governments of the cause, he made, Persian, uh, he, he made per the Persian capital of Tehran his home base and started running in political circles. He quickly befriended the British ambassador uh, who became his mentor uh, on Iranian royal protocol and helped him build his political contacts. Uh, after three years, it took him three years, he was finally granted an audience with the King Nasser al-Din Shah. And the King was so impressed with Manikji, he is said to have explained, this person appears to be noble and deserving. Um, and actually, if anybody is interested, uh, uh, Malcolm Debu has a very interesting article where he actually lays out um, the conversation that unfolded between Manichi and uh, Nasser al Din Shah during this first uh, during this first encounter on a on a um, um, on his in his article on avista.org. Um, uh, so on his first objective in terms of the Jezie, he enlisted the support of the British to create diplomatic pressure, uh, starting with uh, Dadabai Narauji, another prominent Zaratushti, uh, 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 Parsi, and I believe parliamentarian. Uh, as well as the Viceroy of India and the English ambassador. Uh, and it was a long and slow process to get rid of this. Uh, after his initial meeting in 1860, he was able to get a nominal re uh, reduction. Later that year, he did have a major breakthrough uh, when he was able to convince uh, uh, the, uh, the Shah uh, to allow Bombay Parsis to pay the Jezie in full for all Zoroastrians directly to the Tehran treasury therefore lifting that burden off of um, the Zoroastrian community and shifting that board burden to a much more, uh, a much more prosperous mm -hmm. community. Um, but it actually wasn't until 1882, eight years at, before his death, and uh, uh, that the king would issue a royal decree uh, abolishing the Jezia entirely. So the entire effort took him 25 years. On his second objective, he made a lot of progress. He managed to help end uh, the ban of Zoroastrians' formal education. And then he went on to building seven, uh, 12 school, uh, Zoroastrian schools, including a boarding school in Tehran. He recruited Parsis as instructors to ensure that there was a similar level of education that was uh, given to, uh, to given to Irani Zaratushtis as they were receiving in, in India. And literacy rate, rates as a result skyrocketed. Um, he also secured a royal decree that allowed Zoroastrians to establish anjumans uh, mm -hmm. uh, and trusts, uh, and specifically the ones in Yazd and Kerman. So this allowed the community to better organize themselves. And he was a massive builder. He built Atash Birams in Yazd and Kerman. He built Dachmez in those cities as well as in Tehran. Uh, the Dachmez is the Tower of Silence, uh, which is the traditional burial sites uh, for Zoroastrians. Um, he modernized the pilgrimage sites in Peter Sabs and Peter Banu Pars. He set up an orphanage uh, and he garnered dowries uh, for, for poor and orphan girls 
so that they could actually have the, the dowry that they needed to get married. And this effectively resulted in approximately 100 marriages, uh, which for a community of 7,000 is actually quite substantial. Um, and in some cases, uh, Manikji actually paid for this out of his own pocket. One very interesting thing about him is roughly around, uh, probably around three years into his second journey uh, back to Iran, uh, he stopped receiving a salary from the Amelioration Society so that he would have a lot more freedom uh, to what he thought was most important for the community rather than having to be beholden to uh, the Parsis in, uh, in India. Um, he also sent many Zoroastrians to Bombay where Parsis uh, were waiting to educate and train them so that they can come back and be more capable members of their societies. And one thing that he indirectly, there's two, actually two things he indirectly did uh, that really helped the, uh, the community. One was he, uh, he encouraged Zoroastrians to move to Tehran. When he arrived in, uh, in Iran, there were only 50 Zoroastrians living there. Uh, so beyond building the, uh, the school and the Dakhne and also building a, a hostel out there, he just did, had a general push for them to relocate there. And later when Tehran would become the political and economic hub of the Middle East, the Zoroastrians were well prepared to benefit from that. Um, the other thing was that he instilled great interest uh, for Iran and Zoroastrians and Iranian intellectuals. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, that's another contribution that Monarchy was able to do. He was able to rekindle interest in the Iranian intelligentsia. And most of them were members of the Qajar uh, aristocracy who had, uh, you know, were educated in the ancient Iran and the culture of ancient Iran. So that's the that's a phenomenon we see for the first time. They started taking interest in pre-Islamic Iran uh, by the, you know, by other than the Zoroastrians in the larger community. And Monarchy had a lot to do with that. Um, so a lot of people from our previous slide are asking about the population in Tehran. So just to reiterate, it was roughly about 50 people that were living in Tehran. So it was a pretty uh, unsubstantial uh, population uh, at, the that, at the time. Um, so just to add to what Mirov said, one of the other things that Monarchy had to do, had to get permission from Nasser ad Shah for the establishment of the schools. Because the schools, especially schools for girls were banned in Islamic countries. So he, he had to be uh, very persuasive. And also the two Anjumans that were established in Kerman and Yazd, and they were called an, an Nasari Anjuman because Nasser ad Shah they were recognized by the governmental uh, bodies as official organization. And that made a lot of difference because now they were able to go on, you know, uh, and uh, appeal on behalf of the community. That was uh, also quite an accomplishment. Um, so look, uh, Manajee was extremely successful in this. If, if this was an exam, I would give him about a 95 to 96%. But there were a few places that he did fall short uh, not because of his own doing, but just because of a lot of resistance. The man was extremely popular, but he was also very unliked. And actually, there were several attempts on his life uh, because of the work that he was doing and also a lot of the travels that he was doing. He managed to survive them all and, uh, you know, die of natural causes uh, in, in Tehran. Uh, but one area that he did fall short was criminal justice. Uh, he did lobby for the equal treatments under civil and criminal codes. Uh, for Zoroastrians, including uh, justice served to Muslims who murdered and assaulted Zoroastrians, uh, but usually escaped punishment. Uh, unfortunately, the religious authorities were strongly opposed to this, and the murder, rapes, and kidnappings did continue, and they did well continue after he had, uh, after he had exited the picture. Um, so for us, to, for us to better understand what was the impact of Manikji and the Amelioration Society. Let's again look at the population number. So uh, since conversions aren't uh, really a thing within the, the Zoroastrian community, especially at the time, um, we can use this as an indicator of whether the community was healthier and if people were living longer and in a better position to uh, create their family. So the, the census, the original census was in 1854, but then the next census took place Around, uh, around 1893, which was rough, right after Manikshi's death. And what happened there was the population was seen to have grown about 30%. Um, 
So in 40 years, the population jumped from 7,000 to roughly 9,000. Um, it then grew another 10 percentage points by the turn of the century. Um, but the real growth picked up in around 1920s. Um, and while the, uh, the Amelioration Society set the foundation, there was actually another force that had a big part in this. And maybe you want to talk a little bit about the role that Pahlavis played here. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, Iran, Middle East got the retrieve when the Pahlavis came to power in 1925 and uh, until 1979. Uh, the population of Zoroastrians basically went up to around 80,000. Of course, much of that has depleted since the Islamic revolution with people migrating out. And, uh, you know, that was a great, the golden days of Iran. So those of us who were born in that time, we were born during the golden years of Iran in the past 14th century. I mean, no, no question about it. Uh, we got uh, public education, public health, uh, anything, you name it, you know, people adopting surnames, birth certificates, uh, a ministry to register your property that you didn't no longer have to go to the Ayatollah. This all came as a result of the Pahlavis. So without the Pahlavis, I think Iran would have been disappeared as a country. So we can- so, and, and, so, so a lot of that was uh, the foundation that Manikji had set. So first of all, the community was in a better position for them to take advantage of the modernization of Iran. Secondly, there was also this part of it where he instilled this, uh, 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 this spirit of uh, the pre-Islamic identity within the intelligentsia, uh, which allowed for Zoroastrians to take on a prominent, uh, at least Zoroastrian culture to take on a prominent role within Persian culture. Um, so, so that was the remarkable, uh, the remarkable story of what Manikshi was able to do for the community. And as the population of Zoroastrians grew, so did the community's wealth and prominence in all facets of Iranian life. Just like Parsis in India, uh, out emerged several prominent figures who shaped business, government, and academia. So, and we have three examples of here, and maybe you can share with us who each of these individuals are. Yeah, these are basically the three well-known uh, figures on a national scale. The first one was Arbab Jamshid Jamshidian. He was a wealthy merchant who established uh, trade ac across the country and overseas. He was in fact the first representative to the Majlis when uh, Iran finally adopted the constitutional monarchy in uh, 1907. He served there for a short while. The next one was uh, Arbov Chehosro Sharof. He actually spent a year in Bombay before coming back to Kerman. He was a teacher. Then he went to Tehran, was associated with Arbov uh, Jamshidian. Then he took over as the representative, and uh, he was also in public service, uh, the telephone system in Iran, the mausoleum of Ferdowsi, a lot of things are owed to him. And Farhang Mir was the next generation. He uh, obviously came uh, to prominence during the time of uh, Muhammad Reza Shah, the second Pahlavi, and he was a prominent chancellor of the university. Uh, because the constitution restricted who can become a minister, you have to be a Muslim. Otherwise, Farhang Mir could have easily been the minister of finance or whatever. I mean, in effect, that's what he was. And of course, after the revolution, he was lucky to have been escaped to manage to get out of Iran. Otherwise, he would have been prosecuted. And he was, uh, uh, and, and so, so the interesting thing about these two, so Kekhos Sharok also oversaw the central silo during a major famine in Iran. And because he was such an honest, and good steward of the country's resources, uh, he was able to uh, he was able to get landowners to sell crops at a reasonable price. Uh, price, and he wasn't he did not take any bribes for this, and was able to help the country overcome that situation rather quickly and effectively. And Farhang and Mir, as my father said, is an example of how this discrimination did continue and persist in uh, in in Iran uh, even well after Manikji's involvement. The whole thing of Zoroastrians not being able to take the highest posts of government is is an exact example of this. But there are many more examples. I mean, these are just the three. And right? these are just three. There, there are many examples that directly resulted from that. And even today, a lot of examples of exceptional uh, men and women uh, within the Iranian Zoroastrian community, and of course, even more to come in future generations. So what is the what is the legacy of Manikshi? I would say that there is a lot of reverence within the Iranian Zoroastrian community for 
uh, uh, for, for him. Uh, there is a bust of him that does appear outside of the Atesh Baron in Yazd, uh, and as well as Kerman. And, um, uh, and here's an example of one big fan of Manikshi who, uh, uh, who actually went out of his way to hunt down his, uh, his, uh, his grandson. Uh, and Dad, maybe you could tell a little about the story because I believe he reached out to you for this talk. Yeah, I mean, uh, most of you probably know Alayar. He's in this picture himself. He is a big fan of Manakji, like most Iranians, but he is very vocal about it. And uh, apparently on his, one of his trips to Bombay, he reached out and found a great grandson of uh, Manakji living in Bombay and uh, had some pictures taken. So Alayar, do you want to unmute yourself and talk about it? Because I know you're... Uh, uh, eloquent speaker for monarchy. All right. Well, that's it. So, I'm not, we're not going to, well, I mean, if he's on the call, let him. Uh, Alay or Alpha, if you're on the call, do you want to? Can you uh, give me the full name again and I can uh, request them to unmute? I don't know what name he logged in. Mm. He's, he's there as Alay. Well, maybe later on he can speak. That's fine. Just a second. I mean, Alayar actually, once he heard about this talk, he reached out to me and sent his pictures, and he actually sent more information. So obviously, he was very excited. Uh, and I know I, he was I just unmute. Alayar, look at your computer. I just sent you an unmute request. Uh, yeah, this is Alayar Dabestani. It was a fascinating story, by the way. And I uh, uh, really thank uh, Viraf and Mayor Borslin for that. I had a great opportunity of meeting Tampton, Manukji, Dover in uh, Dadar Colony about a few months back when I went to India. I was so fascinated. And uh, I told him that, frankly, and uh, after hugging and everything, I'm one of the products of your grand-grandfather that I'm here. Otherwise, I could not educate or going to school or none of them. We really owe him a great deal, so much that I, I don't know how can I explain that I cried. So the, uh, he's done so much to us and the presentation that Mayor Bordin and Virov did is, was fascinating. Thank you very much. In this chart, there is a, shows the number of people in Sharif Abad. Probably some of them are your grandfather and your great, great grandfather. You probably can un, uh, unmask them and put the name next to them, right? Yeah, Sharif Abad, definitely we still have a, uh, not that many left. Most of them, they moved to uh, Tehran and uh, other uh, places and uh, countries. But uh, the school that uh, we had it was uh, funded by the Parsis, Davistani, Jamshidi. And uh, those days, I remember that we could not go to the school otherwise. They, they said that you are Najes, you are Kafir, you cannot come attend to the school. And uh, all the education that uh, we got and everything was uh, not only in Sharif Abad, about 24 schools they built it in all over Iran, especially in the villages like uh, Khoramshah, Mariamad, uh, Nasi Abad, uh, Nusrat Abad, uh, uh, Mazra Kalantar, and many, many other places. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how I can express our gratitude. Uh, toward the uh, enlistment of the Artushis in Iran. And uh, if it wasn't because of Monokji and Parsis, really in general of helping us, we would not have been there. And I really wanted to thank and appreciate everybody. Thank you, Allah. Thank, thank you, Allah. Yeah. So look, the I would love to sit here and say that the, uh, the persecution against the Rastrians has been completely resolved, but in fact, it's actually regressed uh, under the Islamic Republic. Uh, and uh, for example, one area of this is within this, this pesky inheritance ruling uh, law that, that exists. 
Um, and this is an example of a court ruling exactly on that. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about what this is? Yeah, so this is a case, particular case of a Zartushti man, a family. Uh, one of the sons converts to Islam and the others do not. So upon the demise of the parents, the, uh, the, the boy who had converted, he writes an appeal to the supreme leader, Ayatollah Khamenei, and that's the, uh, that's the letter on the, on the right. And he basically asks the question, if in the Islamic Republic, one of the members uh, converts to Islam in the matter of inheritance, what happens? And right here in the middle, Ayatollah responds very briefly. And he says, with the existence of a Muslim inheritor, the coffers get nothing. So that's the final ruling. What you see on the other side is actually the other brothers, and they are named here. Rostam, Daryush, Behruz, and the sisters Parwane and Afsane. They have made an appeal to the court that in the matter of inheritance, what happens to our share? And then the court basically receives confirmation from the Zoroastrian Association of Tehran that, yeah, this, the parents were Zartushtis and all that. But by this time, this fellow Behruz who converted, he's received this uh, verdict from Ayatollah. So based on that, the court makes a rule and the ruling is on the second page. He said, at this point, this court uh, in the matter of uh, inheritance of this Zartushti couple recognize only one inheritor and that's the, uh, that's the one who converted. So that's the final ruling that uh, he is gonna receive everything and the others get nothing. So this is just one example of the persecution that's still, uh, uh, that, that Zoroastrians are still experiencing in, uh, in Iran. Um, and as a result of it, you're seeing a second exodus of Zarathustris, this time not to uh, South Asia, uh, but this time to the, to the West. Um, and so the populations are once again starting to, uh, starting to diminish within, within the country. Um, and the persecution, discrimination is not just uh, is, is not just focused within Iran. Uh, for example, one interesting story I had was uh, uh, I, I used to live in uh, the, 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 the Persian Gulf uh, and on visiting my friends in Bahrain, I learned that uh, Shia Bahrainis are actually called Majus or as Aloyar said, Najes, which essentially is a, another pejorative that's used for, uh, for, uh, uh, for Zartushtis or fire worshippers. So because Bahrain is ruled by the Sunnis and they have a lot of aggression towards the Shia population, the way that they insult them is by calling them fire worshippers or majuses. Um, so with all of this information, what, what are the lessons that we can learn from this? And I think number one is to make sure that we know our identity and our story as a Zoroastrian community and that we share it. There's a lot of information that we've shared here today but there is still a lot of information that hasn't been uncovered. And for any of you aspiring academics and scholars out there, I think that this is a, a great opportunity for you to really uncover and unfold what, our, uh, what exactly has happened to the history of Zoroastrians uh, over the past 1300 years. Uh, and it's also important for us to share amongst ourselves, our children, our parents, our grandparents, what we already know um, and also make sure that the rest of the world knows around it. The second thing is a united community can overcome odds. Whether you're Iranian or you're Parsi, we're all Zoroastrians at the end of the day. Uh, and it is important that we work together to help uh, ensure that the, uh, the, continu the continuity and the, uh, the prosperity of our community. And that we do open ourselves up uh, to help from the outside community when we need it in order to make it the way that Manichi was able to enlist the support of the British, uh, as well as other uh, diplomats in his fight for, uh, uh, for the end of discrimination. And lastly, as a community, we should stand up against persecution and injustice of any kind because, because of what our people have gone through uh, and all the sufferings that we have seen, uh, we shouldn't be excusing this in any form uh, or any kind, whether it is the racial discrimination uh, that we are experiencing in North America today, uh, even today, 
uh, or it's the discrimination that may be occurring in India and South Asia more broadly. Uh, we should be a very vocal uh, uh, proponent of justice and equity. And one example I can point to is during my college years, uh, uh, there was a big push for divestment from the country of Sudan because of the atrocities they were committing on the South Sudanese people. And one of the strongest supporters on my college campus was the Jewish community because they said never again. And not just for my, our community, but for any community in the world, wherever there's injustice, they, this group would stand up for it. And I believe us as a Zoroastrian community uh, uh, should also take a similar stance based on what we went through. Um, I do, thank I, you. I also have an appeal to all the Iranians officially that you should take the time to document your family history uh, while you still have the memories fresh in your mind because these are stories we need to make sure are told to our next generation. So uh, that's a, uh, incumbent upon all of us. In fact, all of the Zartushtis to do that. That uh, in fact, I know of one project by the Iranian Jews who came to America after the Islamic revolution. They all started documenting uh, what happened to their community, how they prospered under the Pahlavis and all that. So that's something we should also do. I mean, we owe it to ourselves and to our next generation. Thank you so much for letting us uh, present today. Um, uh, sorry for running over so much. 1,300 years is a lot to cover in a, in a, in a call. Um, I do see a couple of questions that are coming up here, um, and I'm happy to try to answer. We're happy to try to answer a few of them. Uh, the first one I see from Shudin uh, is uh, regarding the Christian and Jewish who were regarded as people of the book was because, uh, 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 because similar to Islam, uh, these religious were Abrahamic. Uh, 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 that is the case. Uh, however, uh, there is some um, uh, there there are, are some documentations that uh, that for the first hundred years of the uh, uh, after the Sasanians that Zaratushtis were also considered Dimi. Now this is this is debated, but uh, but it, it it is something that has been uh, that has been noted. And we can't say for sure. Now, what happened exactly that the status of Zoroastrians were shifted to Kathir? Um, uh, one could speculate it's probably because they, uh, there was a sense that this was the majority of the population. And the only way that they are going to be able to get the majority of the population to convert to Islam is to, is to basically put extra pressure upon them. Um, Uh, maybe uh, uh, Tanya and Arzan, I don't know if you guys have uh, been monitoring the chats or seen any questions. I have a huge list of questions here. Um, one of the questions you already answered in a way, which was how can uh, Zoroastrians worldwide today um, uplift the Zoroastrians in Iran that Menekji uh, initiated? Like how can we support and honor his legacy essentially? And I believe you answered that uh, just at the end. If there's anything else you wanted to add, that was just a very popular question. What can we do today? to ensure we continue his legacy. You're up also, can you stop sharing the screen so we can, everybody can see each other? Uh, one, one of the things about uh, the Zartushti family, that's uh, my wife's uh, parents, they donated funds to the Parsi General Hospital for one actually ward, which is now, uh, you know, providing for free medical care. So obviously uh, that's something they did. I, again, I mean, I would reiterate, you need to learn your story, you need to tell the story, uh, and we need more people who are discovering our stories. So um, uh, I also would like to uh, give a big thank you to uh, Dr. Darius Jahanyan. He is actually probably a lot of this, uh, a lot of this presentation comes from the research that he has done on this topic. Uh, and he's dug through a lot of primary sources uh, in order to really be able to tell the story. Uh, for those uh, of you who are interested, he has a couple of articles on avista.org that I highly recommend that you read and that they provide full color of it. But doing things like what uh, do, uh, Dr. Jahanyan has done or uh, what my father and other people in the community are doing in terms of just telling the story and discovering the story is very important for us uh, to make sure that we, that we, do, we do honor our, uh, our heritage and our history. 
Thank you. Another popular question was that when you showed the Zoroastrian population data that was collected by Manekji in 1850, why was there no mention of Zoroastrians in Tehran in his data? Well, there, at the time of Manekji, there were probably a few Zoroastrians in Tehran, but those were mostly uh, housemates, especially the Qajars, you know, who had uh, all these uh, harams. They wanted to bring men from the provinces who they can trust. So the first group of Zartushtis that were taken to Tehran were actually people who were working in the gardens or in the, you know, in the Haram Saras because they were trusted. Then there came the merchants and the, you know, the wealthier people and the, that group. At the time of Monarchy, those people were just un invisible. I don't know how many there were. There were very few of them. Thank you. Um, another question, a lot of people are very interested in learning more about this topic. So they're wondering if there's any articles or books that you could guide them towards just to learn more about this topic. And specifically, um, they wanted to learn about the conditions of Zoroastrians in the rural areas of Yazd and Karman. Well, uh, we don't show this book, The Fire Within. It was interesting, uh, the Dinyar Patel, I, who presented a few few sessions ago, he's a scholar, Zoroastrian scholar, he's in Bombay. Uh, he sent me some articles and he actually copied some articles from that book and sent to me uh, for reference. Uh, there is an article by uh, Borger Awari there on Monarchy, uh, which uh, talks about Monarchy. There is another one by uh, Strasberg, he's a professor of Zoroastrian studies at the uh, Nor Nor Norwegian University, is a German on the contribution of monarchy to rekindling the Iranian identity. There are quite a few. So, I mean, if you are interested, we can send you uh, Dabu, Malcolm Dabu wrote an article. I'm sure there are many articles on monarchy. If that's what uh, the interest is. Um, I'm copying over a couple, of, uh, a couple of links to articles that could be interesting for you. I've also uh, taken uh, care to cite the sources throughout this presentation. Um, and uh, and happy to find a way to circulate those sources uh, uh, through uh, uh, through Fizona talks to everybody if they want to dig deeper into those. Um, the uh, the other thing I would point to is again uh, uh, Darisha Jahanian has written a couple of great articles on this. Um, I'd also look into Mary Boyce, who I believe has uh, uh, the late Mary Boyce, who has actually spent a, su a substantial amount of time in Iran and doing a lot of this documentation as well. Okay, thank you. And thank you for sharing that link. I'll make sure that we get it across our social channels. Um, and I'll link that again, everyone at the end. Um, if you want more information, Fazana will be sharing that. So please do follow us on our Instagram and Facebook or subscribe to our e-newsletter to get more information. Um, another question was about, actually, uh, I believe your family. So they said, what happened to the Sarushian family's land and large parcels of beautiful farms, buildings, and properties in Kerman that the late Arbab Jamshid Sarushian and his ancestors had properly owned? Are they still confiscated and not given back to well, their children? that's a long story. I don't think you want to hold everybody up to go <laughs> over that. But, uh, yeah, that's true. I mean, uh, a lot of that actually uh, was occurred during the time of Reza Shah. Uh, when Reza Shah came to power, most of the land in Iran and the villages were owned by the Qajar dynasty. The Qajars treated Iran as their personal property. And when Reza Shah came to power, he needed revenue to undertake all this you know, infrastructure, railroad, uh, military, and army to defend the country. So he had to impose tax, tax on the, and he said he imposed tax on each village that they had to produce so much. And if uh, most of these villages were owned by the Qajar Khans that were in Tehran, they never, they were absent in Qajar. So they were forced to sell. And uh, uh, in, in a lot of in other provinces like Kerman and Yazd, the Zoroastrians were able to buy some of these properties and they became landlords. And of course, what happened during the time of uh, Muhammad Reza Shah in 1963, he uh, had a, um, Basically, uh, uh, he came up with this initiative called the White Revolution, which was put to uh, uh, to public for their uh, you know their vote. Uh, land reform was one. 
Uh, then there was, uh, uh, the women were given the right to vote and the whole nation, but, and there were six of them, six were asked to uh, vote on it. And of course it passed, it passed the parliament. And that's when the first time you hear of Ayatollah Khomeini, because he revolted against that. He said, why are the women given the right to vote? And uh, of course, at the time, the Shah made a mistake of not going through with a military uh, trial of him and you know, let him go to Iraq. And of course, he came back to, uh, uh, to destroy the country. Uh, so I think the point was that under the, uh, yeah, the, 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 that, that uh, I think uh, the less editorialized version of that would be that under the, the Pahlavis, there was uh, a, a level of prosperity. Um, when the Islamic Republic came into power, um, a lot of wealthy uh, individuals, not just Zaratushtis, uh, but of all type, uh, had their land uh, either uh, repossessed or put under lockdown. Cool. Um, should we move on to the next question? Sure. Um, another question is, what are your thoughts about the Islamophobia that exists among some Zoroastrians today? What should we do so we don't get into a vicious circle? Can you repeat that? Well, I think, I think in order to avoid us from uh, getting into the vicious circle, I th look, I think that there is a lot within the community that we may not, uh, that we may see differences in, in view, uh, but there are a lot of things that you can also hold into that, that, that are very common points within us. And I think the number one is the, the shared history uh, that came a little bit apart uh, when the, the Parsis started migrating and immigrating to British India um, or India at the time. Um, but it, re it converged once again around the time of Manakji and the Amelioration Society. And, uh, and I think that these are the points that our community can really unite and find common ground on in order to better uncover and discover what our roots are and to, to celebrate that. Thank you. Um, another question. Do you have any indica indication to the reason um, Hataria refused the salary of the Milleration Society? Could this have been preempting British intelligence officers later being installed in the post? <laughs> <laughs> That's a, um, that, I think that's, that's, that's above my, my pay grade to answer. No, I think uh, that's, a, uh, that's but, uh, I mean, my, the, uh, it, uh, it, my, my sense of it from what I've read it is it had the more to do with him to have the autonomy to do what he wanted. So for example, he was extremely interested in uncovering uh, our pre-Islamic roots, um, which it seemed like the Amelioration Society wasn't as excited about. He even uh, managed to uh, come about like a, a pretty, uh, a pretty sizable coin collection, pre-Islamic coin collection, about like 300 coins, which was, which was pretty priceless. And when he went, when he tried to basically give it, uh, give it to somebody to uh, give it back to the Parsi community to do something with it, uh, in order to help memorialize it, it sounds like, uh, from my reading, that they refused it. So it sounds like there was a level of deviation in terms of what he thought was important for the community, and what he uh, thought the amelioration society. I thought was important. So what it allowed him to do was he was able to plug them in where he thought that where, where there was an alignment and interest and then he was able to go off and do the other things that he also thought were very important. And don't forget he was a merchant by trade so the guy was pretty well skilled in taking care of himself. Uh, so it wasn't as if he was starving. He was able to make his own bread. Thank you. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to ask one more question. We have a many questions. So uh, one thing before my last question is, is there a way for people to still stay connected if they want to ask more questions? Um, or do you recommend they kind of, is there some things they can go towards to kind of get those answers? Uh, sure. I, I mean, we're happy to share our emails if that's a good way to do that. Um, and I can drop that into the chat box. Okay. And uh, uh, Tanya, you, you guys can also feel free to share that to anybody who is interested. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, we have so many questions. I mean, people are so engaged in this topic, and I feel like we just don't have enough time to get to all of them. So the last sure. question, um, they mentioned that discriminatory practices are still present today, maybe in a more sophisticated manner against Zoroastrians in Iran, uh, whether it's by confiscating their land, property without compensation, or not allowing them to participate in economic activities of the highest level. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're asking, when do you think we'll see the next Hataria to protest and change these policies? 
Well, the first one took, what, 13th century to materialize, so God knows how long would it take for the second one, right? Mm -hmm. From the fall of the Sasanian to the arrival of monarchy it was, what, 12 centuries, 13th centuries? Uh, so hopefully this time it won't take that long. Um, I, don't, I don't think we can, uh, I, I honestly don't think we can wait 13th centuries for the next one. Um, I mean, the, the the next person can be can be in existence now. Um, again, what what were the qualities that uh, that made Manichi perfect for this? So there were the people around him that were able to provide the support for him. There was a very wealthy benefactor, and there was a strong Iranian woman who uh, who really instilled the principles and the values of service and the history of our people within, uh, within the community around her. There is, uh, so there were those two elements that allowed for him to happen. Obviously the person that comes around needs to be sturdy and compact. Thankfully our people aren't terribly tall. So a lot of people fit that, uh, fit that criteria. Um, and it has to be somebody who is well-educated, uh, skilled in the art of diplomacy uh, and, and well-traveled. That's, again, a lot of people within the community. And lastly, it has to be somebody who has a love for the, uh, uh, for the culture and community. Um, I guess I'm pretty much describing Arzan. So it looks like you're the best guy. Arzan, yes. <laughs> well, thank you, um, Dr. Mebrazine Veroff. Thank you so much for your time today. Cannot even thank you enough for this incredibly insightful presentation. I know a lot of us have learned incredible amount of information today that we might not have been aware of before. Um, again, I will be sharing a, a recorded version of this presentation on Fazana's YouTube. So please um, just follow us, um, whether it's through our e-newsletter or our social media to get news about when this video will be up. Thank you so much for your time, for your insights, for your research. Um, and if people want to continue this conversation, please do reach out. The email has been dropped in the chat, but we will also again share that for anybody who still wants to engage in this conversation. And uh, we're so excited to kind of continue these talks in the future. We have another incredible discussion happening next Saturday, so stay tuned for um, news about that. But thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you all the participants. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Tanya. Thank, thank you, Arzan. Thank you, everybody else. Thank yes, you, Dr. Mebrazin and Virat. Thank you very much. I think the interest that has been just shown in the comments is, uh, I think you're onto something. There is a lot of uh, information here that we none of us knew about. And so, uh, you know, we, I can't wait for you guys to do more research and whenever you're ready for the next talk, let's continue this conversation. I don't think it has to end with just this one talk. And um, so, you know, on, on, on this or other topics, and if there are other people on this, uh, you know, chat who are researching topics, uh, you know, that would be of interest to uh, Zarkustis anywhere in the world, uh, you know, just drop me an email uh, with, with what you would like to do. And then, you know, we will try to slot things. Uh, as they come along, we are trying to do a couple of these every month so that we don't overload people with, uh, with, uh, you know, I mean, we respect everybody has limited time and, you know, in just now, in this time, everybody's kind of getting zoomed out in a way, but uh, we are always open for more interesting talks uh, in the future. That is really what the Pizana Talks platform is. And Pizana just wants to facilitate. We are not necessarily the ones who are generating this research. We just want to highlight, uh, you know, amazing Zarkusi things that are happening in the world or amazing Zarkusi things. So uh, with that, the next week's talk will be by Mobediar Mashat Kutserbiani. Uh, she's a young Mobediar from Toronto, and uh, she has some interesting thoughts. And, uh, you know, uh, we, we would like to in, uh, invite her, and we hope that we also get a lot more younger folks joining in on this talk. So with that, I thank Tanya for kind of you know, facilitating and, and running the show on this one. And again, thanks to Raf and Mirbuzin. And thank you to all 181 of you who joined on this talk from all over the world. Um, have a good Sunday, uh, good afternoon, good evening, good night, wherever you may be from. And uh, you know, hope to see you all on the next Islamic operation. Thank you. <laughs>